Today is about the rest of your life. It's about tomorrow and the day after that. The future God has planned for you shouldn't be a haphazard approach to life. You might feel stuck, but you don't have to be. Perhaps you're discouraged. It's time to deal with that. And if you feel uncertain, you can find clarity. You may not know what's next, but God does. He's there waiting for you in your tomorrow. So step into it and discover God's presence and purpose in your life. Starting today, starting now, it's time to move forward. It's time we rise above our circumstances, conquer our fears, face the future with faith, prevail over the past, aspire to accomplish greater things, reclaim our birthright, proclaim His power, and claim God's promises. God has more for us. It's not time to stop. It's time to move forward. Today on Turning Point, Dr. Jeremiah reminds us that God is interested in the desires of our hearts. When I'm talking about a dream, I'm not describing a self-made vision of your life apart from God's will. And I'm not using the word as the ancient prophets did when supernatural visions of inspired revelation came across them. I'm talking about envisioning the next step or the next stage of your life. That's coming up on today's special forward edition of Turning Point. In just a moment, Dr. Jeremiah will reveal how you can cultivate a dream for your life that outlasts the world, transforms time, changes eternity, and advances God's cause and His kingdom for His glory. Find this and nine other ways you can know God's purpose, feel God's power, and accomplish God's plan for your life in Dr. Jeremiah's new book, Forward, Discovering God's Presence and Purpose in Your Tomorrow. You'll learn the biblical strategy about how to claim the future God has prepared uniquely for you, no matter your age or your circumstance. Forward releases worldwide October 6th, but you can pre-order your copy today when you give a gift of any amount in support of this program. And in appreciation of your gift of $75 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will send you the Forward set, including his new book, his entire teaching series on CD or DVD with a correlating study guide, and the How to Move Forward interview special with Sheila Walsh on DVD. Plus, with your pre-order of the book or set, Dr. Jeremiah will also send you his Move Forward motivation cards. As a part of this bonus, you will also receive instant access to Difference Makers, a collection of five audio messages from Dr. Jeremiah, examining the lives of people in the Bible who God moved forward to impact their world. Pre-order the Forward book or set by October 6th. Contact Turning Point today. Thank you for watching Forward here on Turning Point. In appreciation of your viewership, Dr. Jeremiah would like to send you these Move Forward Motivation Cards absolutely free. Contact Turning Point today. And now, here is Dr. Jeremiah with his message, Dream, Seize Your Tomorrow Today. When we think of great dreamers, we think of people like George Lucas, Elon Musk, or Walt Disney. I mean, anyone who's seen a Star Wars movie, read about electric cars, or visited Disney World, knows that great accomplishments begin with one person's larger-than-life imagination. Walt Disney's dream began with cartoon sketches, two failed companies, and a borrowed book on animation. In time, he brought beloved characters to life. He created classic films and built Disney World, Disneyland, and the Epcot Center. He created the happiest place on earth and became known as the man who made dreams come true. When Disney was diagnosed with lung cancer, he was still planning movies, developing theme parks, and mulling over his newest idea, an experimental prototype community of tomorrow, or Epcot. As he lay on his deathbed with his brother Roy sitting nearby, Walt looked up at the hospital ceiling tiles, raised his finger, and every fourth tile, he said, represented a square mile. Using that mental map, he suggested routes for his envisioned highways and monorails. Having said all of that, I believe Walt Disney's dreams were too small. Believe it or not, you and I can dream bigger dreams than Disney ever conceived. 
It's one thing to invest one's life in a magic kingdom, and it's quite another to play a part in the kingdom of God. As followers of Christ, we can cultivate a dream for our lives that outlasts the world, transforms time, changes eternity, and advances his cause and his kingdom for his glory. In fact, that's the story of the Bible. The Bible is filled with people who saw what life could look like in God's kingdom and then moved forward in faith. All these stories, the dreams of men and women of God thousands of years ago, still inspire and guide and affect us more than we know. They remind us to keep dreaming. There's always more out in front of us, always a reason to look forward to tomorrow. By the way, when I'm talking about a dream, I'm not describing a self-made vision of your life apart from God's will. And I'm not using the word as the ancient prophets did when supernatural visions of inspired revelation came across them. I'm not talking about seeing heavenly creatures or having apocalyptic dreams. No, instead, I'm talking about envisioning the next step or the next stage of your life. A dream or a vision is simply a picture of what you feel God wants you to do next. Let's talk for just a moment about the power of a dream. For hundreds of years, Israel had worshipped around the frayed remains of the tabernacle, the elaborate tent that was constructed in the days of Moses as a portable house of worship. But now... The nation was occupying the land God had promised, and Jerusalem was its capital. So David began dreaming of a permanent place where people could worship for centuries to come. David's story reveals the principles that you and I can follow as we build our own dreams. Principle number one, root your dream in history. In 2 Samuel 7, David told the prophet Nathan, See, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. So David grabbed hold of his dream and began moving forward to see its fulfillment. But David's idea to build a temple didn't just poof into his head like an exploding nebula. Oh no, it was rooted in the history of Israel. You see, centuries before God told Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice and burnt offering on a distant mountain. And God was specific about the mountain, not just any hilltop would do. No, it had to be Mount Moriah. A thousand years later, when David and then Solomon planned to build the Jewish temple, they placed it on that very mountain, Mount Moriah. David's vision for the location of his temple had roots as deep as Genesis 22. It was grounded in the story of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his only begotten son as a burnt offering. And it's no coincidence that a thousand years after David, Jesus Christ gave himself as an offering for sin on or near that very ridge. You see, the best dreams don't start with us, but instead are planted in us by God. If it isn't rooted, it's rotten. We stand on the shoulders of others. We are links in a chain that we build on what others have done, even as future generations will build on the work that we have done. That's why it's all right to look around for ideas and see what other people are doing. We get ideas from history and from how others are inspired to act today. To develop your dream, think about your heritage what you love to do, your life experiences. Think about your background. Everything in your life has prepared you for the next step. So look at what's already happening in your life and in your church and start where you are and work outward and forward. Root your dream in history. Second, reproduce your dream in a picture. As ideas and intentions begin to bubble up in your heart and mind, You need to figure out where to begin and how to implement your dream. So you have to nudge the abstract burden into a real-life plan. Let me tell you what I've learned. Visionaries have an uncanny ability to see their dreams 
and convey them in images. That's how David built the impetus needed for his temple project. As we have seen, David's dream began when he told the prophet Nathan, quote, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. The temple wasn't some abstract concept. No, it was a vision that filled David's mind in technicolor. He was able to convey that image to others and motivate them to action by drawing a contrast. Look at my palace with its paneled walls and glorious bulwarks. And look at that frayed tent called tabernacle. Shouldn't God's house be better than any home of yours or mine? You see, the ability to see what could be in the future is essential to straining forward toward the realization of your dream. Don't worry if you can't see the final fulfillment of your long-term dreams. We will walk through the practical steps toward reaching success in the time to come. But for now, what matters is being able to imagine your dream in a way that captivates both others and you. And then number three, reinforce your dream with determination. David discovered that every dream faces discouragements. I can give testimony to that. That's part of the process of proving its validity. David's dream for the temple excited him like nothing else in his whole life. He was fired up, ready to go, eager to lead the campaign to build. He could see it in his mind's eye every time he looked from his palace rooftop toward Mount Moriah. He was ready to see his dream accomplished. But then, if you know the story, the roof caved in. God told David he would not be allowed to build the temple because of his violent past. Here's what God said. David, you shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. It is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts. You talk about the death of a vision, (laughs) but David didn't pout for long. (laughs) I love this story. He told himself something like this. Well, if I can't do it myself, and if God has appointed the task for my son Solomon, then I'll just do all I can to help him succeed. In refusing to give up on the project because he was taken out of the driver's seat, David illustrated a core value of dream building. No dream is ever realized without a huge measure of determination. If you're going to see your dream through, you have to be determined. So root your dream in history, reproduce it in a picture, reinforce it with determination. And number four, reconcile your dream with its cost. As you build your vision, be willing to sacrifice. Let me tell you something that's without possibility of contradiction. Dreams are costly. Dreams are costly, as David found out when God led him to purchase some land for the temple at a high spot in the area. Here's the story. Because he was the venerable king of Israel, I mean, he could have seized the land. He could have just taken it. But David said in 2 Samuel 24, 24, no, 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 I will surely buy it from you for a price, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. Big dreams are expensive. If you've experienced a fulfilled dream, you know what I'm talking about. The cost comes in money, in energy, in criticism, in unbelief, in unplanned obstructions, in unfaithful helpers, and a multitude of other very discouraging things. You have to reconcile your dreams with cost. If you're looking for a cheap, easy way to get where you want to go, Just stop right now. There is no such thing. To realize your dream, if it's a God-given dream, there's a price to pay. But I promise you, it is a price worth paying. Finally, release your dream to your legacy. Looking back on this period of Israel's history, one thing jumps out at me, and here it is. This was David's dream, and it ended up being called Solomon's Temple. David's dream, Solomon's temple. You see, David not only accepted that, he made that happen. It was his dream all right, but when the dream was not going to be realized in his life 
and God said, pass it on to your son, David refused to allow his dream to die when he died. And although he was not allowed to build the temple, the Lord gave him the construction details, which he passed on to his own son, Solomon. Here's what he said. Consider now, Solomon, for the Lord has chosen you to build the house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat. And the plans for all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers all around, of the treasuries of the house of God, and of the treasuries for the dedicated things. You say, Pastor Jeremiah, what does that all mean? Well, the Holy Spirit had instructed David with the specific details of the temple, and David in turn passed them on to his son Solomon. I can imagine David transferring that information from God onto an architectural blueprint and laying it out before Solomon and saying, here it is, boy. God gave this to me, and this is what you're going to build. David had dreamed of building a permanent place where God could be worshipped. And he determined to leave something behind that would honor the Lord. It was his dream and the resources he put in that place that allowed his son Solomon to move quickly toward the construction of the temple. And David's instructions to his son Solomon have been a charge to pastors and missionaries and Christian workers ever since. First Chronicles 28, 20. Be strong and of a good courage and do it. And do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. One Sunday afternoon in 1771, a man named Valentin Howey ducked into a restaurant in Paris for dinner. He sat near the stage, and the show that evening featured blind people and a comedy routine. They were objects of ridicule and cruelty, and the act was designed to make fun of their blindness. Deeply offended, Howey began to develop a burden for the blind. Sometime later, he spotted a sightless street urchin who was begging for coins outside a Parisian church, giving the boy some money. Howie was amazed to see the boy feel the raised markings on the coins and distinguish the amounts. That gave Howie an idea. Why couldn't books be written with raised letters, like images on coins? Why couldn't people learn to read with their fingers? Howie took the boy off the streets, offered him food and shelter, and devised a plan with wooden blocks and numbers and taught the boy to read. In 1784, Howie started the world's first school for blind children. It was in Paris, and one of the first teachers was the blind boy rescued from the streets. But that's just the beginning. Several years later, another boy named Louis was born in the village of Coubertray, France. His father was a farmer and a harness maker, and as a toddler, Lewis loved watching his father work with leather tools. But tragedy struck in 1812 when three-year-old Lewis began playing with a leftover strap of leather, trying to punch holes in it. His hand slipped and the sharp tool punctured and put out his eye. An infection set in that spread to the other eye, and little Lewis ended up blinded in both eyes for his whole life. A local minister named Jacques Poulay loved the boy and began visiting him to read him the Bible. Seeing the boy had a good mind, Father Jacques determined he could receive an education. So at age 10, Louis was enrolled in the school Howie had established in Paris, where he proved to be a brilliant student. Eventually, Louis began teaching other students in the Paris School for the Blind. He studied Howie's method of reading. He also became aware of a system of military communication developed by a French army captain that allowed soldiers to communicate in the dark by running their fingers over a series of dots and dashes. Though still a teenager, Louis Braille began adopting these systems into a program of his own, and in 1829, at age 20, he published a little book on the Braille method of reading. The school resided in a damp building by the River Seine. It was cold and unhealthy, and the food and conditions were poor. Louis got tuberculosis, but he continued working on his system of reading. 
which began catching on and soon was being exported all over the world. As his health failed, Louis said, I am convinced my mission on earth has been accomplished. I asked God to carry me away from this world. Now pause for just a moment with me and think of the chain reaction of that cascading dream. One man developed a burden for the blind when he saw ridiculed actors on stage and a beggar boy on the streets. His burden led him to establish a school and attempt a system of reading. Then a local pastor developed a burden for a blind boy in another village and taught him the Bible and longed to send him to school. And that blind child, Louis Braille, developed a burden to improve and expand Howie's work. And the world was changed. And as a result, millions of sightless souls have experienced the joy of reading the Bible and other books for themselves now for almost two centuries. We may never create a language for the blind or build a temple for the Lord, but please remember there are no small tasks in the Lord's work and no insignificant dreams. Our work is never routine. Our labor is never wasted and our legacy is capable of outliving us. I've always loved radio and everything about radio from sitting next to the radio as a child with my ear to the speaker so I could listen to the Lone Ranger or the Shadow, to putting together night radio kits as a teenager, uh, for reasons I can't explain, I have always loved radio, and radio has had a mysterious hold over me as far back as I can remember. When I became a student at Cedarville College in 1959, I was given the radio opportunity of a lifetime. A new Christian FM station was being launched in Springfield, Ohio, just 15 miles from my home. I don't remember how it happened, but I was able to audition for an on-air announcing position, and I got the job. I did the news. I hosted the call-in music shows. I queued up and played radio programs like Back to the Bible and Unshackled. When I was asked to help start a radio station on the campus of Cedarville College, I teamed up with Paul Gaffney, a college classmate, and my girlfriend and soon-to-be wife, Donna Thompson, and we launched WCDR-FM. In time, that station grew to a network of stations that literally covered the entire Miami Valley with great Christian music and the message of the gospel. When I was a junior in college, God called me into the ministry. It was absolutely, definitely clear to me that I was to become a preacher of the gospel, so I immediately enrolled in Dallas Theological Seminary. Don and I got married right after graduation from college, and we headed off to Texas for four years of postgraduate learning. My greatest regret, if I could call it that, was this. I loved radio. I had spent most of my life involved with radio. Yet now it appeared God was leading me in a totally different direction in terms of my vocation and lifelong calling. Radio was put on hold for four years while I worked on my master's degree. But what happened after that is one of the most amazing stories of my life. After a short stint as a youth pastor in New Jersey and 12 years as a pastor of a startup church in Fort Wayne, Indiana, I accepted the call to Shadow Mountain Community Church in San Diego. And the next year, I began a local five-day-a-week teaching program on a Christian station in San Diego, Salem Radio's KPRZ. And the rest is history. Today, Turning Point hits the airwaves on more than 3,000 radio stations in the United States. Momento Decisivo, the Spanish edition of Turning Point, is heard in every country where Spanish is spoken. So, you can see... God did not call me into the ministry to take my dream away. He called me into the ministry because my dream was way too small. He had a much better and a much bigger plan for my life. And as a result of those experiences, I've learned I can trust God with my dreams, even as I move forward toward his plans for my life. And I've told you all these stories and shared all of this gospel message from the Bible to tell you one thing. You can trust God with his 
vision for your life. You can be like Nehemiah who said, God put it in my heart. And when God puts something in your heart and gives you a dream, never stop until you've realized it and you will be the most blessed person on the face of God's green earth. Dr. Jeremiah will return in a moment with one more inspirational word to close today's program right after this. Thank you for watching today. Did you know that this program is just one part of the ministry of Turning Point, which is committed to delivering the unchanging Word of God to an ever-changing world? This program is only possible because of the generous and faithful support of viewers like you. When you support the ministry of Turning Point, you partner with us to reach across the world with the gospel and with the strong Bible teaching of Dr. Jeremiah through television, radio, print, and digital ministry in several languages and to multiple generations. Please consider supporting this program and the worldwide ministry of Turning Point. When you do, Dr. Jeremiah will thank you by sending his new book, Forward, Discovering God's Presence and Purpose in Your Tomorrow. And if you give $75 or more, he will send you in appreciation his comprehensive forward set. Your gift helps move the ministry forward. Contact Turning Point today. And now with one last word for today's program, here is Dr. Jeremiah. No matter what season of life in which you find yourself, your brightest day can be just around the corner. Take hold of it. Let go of the past, get out of your rut. Choose to run forward toward everything God has planned for the next phase of your life. But remember, this forward journey is not one we do alone. We need Jesus Christ to take even one step. So I hope you know Jesus Christ well, but if you don't, I'd like to introduce him to you today. I would like to send you two resources to start your journey with Christ. The first is a booklet called Your Greatest Turning Point, and the second is our monthly devotional magazine, Turning Points. These resources are yours completely free when you contact Turning Point today. Also available from Dr. Jeremiah, the Jeremiah Study Bible, the culmination of more than four decades of Dr. Jeremiah's study and teaching. Available in NKJV, NIV, and ESV. Plus, Dr. Jeremiah's Airship Genesis Kids Study Bible for the young ones in your life. Order a Bible for yourself or as a gift for someone you know. Contact Turning Point today. Next time on Turning Point. There's so many things that are unprecedented. Sometimes we don't even know how to pray. We don't even know what to ask God for. But you can be sure of this, if you pray, and you're sincere in your heart and you're walking with God, He hears your prayer and He will answer it. Thank you for being with us today. Join us next time as Dr. Jeremiah directs you to consult your Creator and teaches you how to harness the power of prayer. Here on Turning Point.